Good evening. I'm Molly Rosenberg, Director of the Royal Society of Literature, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's celebration of KDIC in a partnered event from the Royal Society of Literature, the British Library, Faber and Curtis Brown Heritage. Rediscovered after 40 years, K. Dick's radical dystopian novel, They, is a stunning meditation on art, memory and nonconformity, published, republished last week. To celebrate the timely new edition of They, published by Faber Editions, tonight writer Claire Louise Bennett will be joined by poet Jay Bernard and K. Dick's family friend, the actor and writer Nat Natasha McElhorn. Their conversation will be led by literary critic and publisher Lucy Scholes, whose writing on all things books, film and art can be read in publications including the Financial Times, The Telegraph, The New York Review of Books and The New York Times Book Review. She hosts Our Shelves, a podcast from the feminist publishing house Virago, writes Recovered, a monthly column for the Paris Review, about out of print and forgotten books that shouldn't be, and is an editor at McNally Editions, a new series of paperbacks devoted to hidden gems that launches this month with the American reissue of K. Dix Day. Lucy, over to you. Thank you so much, Molly. I'm really thrilled to be here this evening to talk about the brilliant they and its equally uh, fascinating and brilliant author, Kay Dick. Um, and I'm even more delighted to welcome such an excellent panel of guests. So I'm going to start by introducing them. Um, Claire Louise Bennett uh, grew up in Wiltshire and studied literature and drama at the University of Roehampton before moving to Ireland, where she worked in and studied theatre for several years. In 2013, she was awarded the inaugural White Review Short Story Prize and her debut book, Pond, was shortlisted for the Dylan Thomas Prize in 2016. Her fiction and essays have appeared in a number of publications, including The White Review, Stinging Fly, Gorse, Harper's Magazine, Vogue Italia, Music and Literature, and The New York Times Magazine. Her new novel, Check Out 19, was shortlisted for the 2021 Goldsmiths Prize. Uh, she's joined by uh, Jay Bernard, who is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Jay is the author of the pamphlets Your Sign is Cuckoo, Girl, English Breakfast and The Red and Yellow Nothing, which was shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award in 2017. Jay was a foil Young Poet of the Year in 2005 and a winner of the Slam Ambassadors UK Spoken Word Championship. Their collection Surge was shortlisted for the RSL on Darcy Prize, the Costa Poetry Award, the T.S. Eliot Prize, the Ford Prize for Best First Collection and the Dylan Thomas Prize. In 2020, they won the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. And last but not least, we have Natasha McElhone, who established herself as a leading actress when she left drama school to play the lead in her first film, Merchant Ivory's Surviving Picasso, opposite Anthony Hopkins. She quickly followed this with Peter Weir's film, The Truman Show, Alan J. Pakula's The Devil's Own, with Brad Pitt and Harrison Ford, and John Frankenheimer's action epic, Ronan, in which she co-starred with Robert De Niro. She also played Rosalind to Kenneth Branagh's Barone in his musical version of William Shakespeare's Love's Labour's Lost. And in the futuristic love story Solaris, she co-starred with George Clooney, directed by Steven Soderbergh. For TV, McElhone has uh, starred in TNT's miniseries The Company, a Golden Globe nominated drama, NBC's Emmy Award uh, nominated miniseries Revelations, but is probably best known for her role as Karen in the seven series of the cult comedy drama Californication. Other TV credits include The First, Designated Survivor, Saints and Strangers, Thorn, Sleephead, Thorn, Sleephead, Sleephead, sorry, The Company and Revelations. This is too many things for you all. <laughs> We've got such a brilliant panel of guests, I can't even get all their uh, wonderful um, uh, work correct. But like I say, I'm so glad they're joining us this evening because I think it's going to be a brilliant discussion. We've got people from different areas, um, literature, film, uh, family, friends at K-Dick, so this is going to be great. And because we're here to celebrate uh, K-Dick and Day, I thought we would begin at the sort of very beginning of this reissue. Molly mentioned at the beginning 
this is uh, this book was originally published in 1977. It's been reissued um, by Faber this week, very excitingly. And I first came across this book a couple of years ago now when I was doing some research for my um, recover column that Molly mentioned. And I'm always on the lookout for interesting books to write about, things that have been missed. And uh, there's plenty of books that get forgotten along the way and uh, for various reasons. And I hope we'll be able to have a chance to discuss that later. But I came across an old obituary about Kadic, which was um, pretty uh, catty, let's put it that way. But it made me very interested about who this author was, who'd published quite a lot of books, even though it seems to me that people keep saying that she really didn't publish that many, but actually there's quite a few. Um, and that she knew some fascinating people and was the heart of the sort of London literary scene in the middle of the 20th century. Um, I went and came across, I found all her novels, I started reading them. I liked the early stuff, I wasn't particularly excited by it. These were novels of manners, a little bit dated, very beautifully written, but nothing to particularly get excited about. And I say that because when I read They, it was like a sort of shot of electricity running down my spine. This was something completely different, uh, completely different to K. Dick's earlier novels and actually quite different to a lot of other novels from this era, even though it, there were some uh, sort of similarities to writers like Anna Caban and maybe books like Fahrenheit 451. Um, and then uh, at the same time that I was coming across K. Dick and writing about her, the, uh, be the literary agent Becky Brown from Curtis Brown Heritage also came across a copy of the and had a very similar feeling to me, that sort of jolt of electricity, knew it was something special. And what you're seeing at the, today is the sort of end result of us both finding this book and then Becky uh, bringing it back into print, getting in touch with the estate. And here we are today with all these wonderful new editions. And I begin with this telediscovery, I think, because it's something that Becky, myself and others have discussed on sort of multiple occasions throughout this journey. That, as I said, there's plenty of books that get lost. There's plenty of authors that get forgotten but it is really rare to find a book and an author like they and K. Dick, um, a book that is both brilliant in and of its own right that sort of makes you kind of you know stand up and take notice but then also a book that seems to speak to the contemporary world uh, to can speak to kind of the current generation now 40 years after it was written in such a kind of fiercely um a sort of loud and fierce way. This is what people seem to keep going back to about this book, that it was sort of prescient, that it speaks to us now really importantly. And for the author to be someone like Kay Dick, who was absolutely fascinating at the heart of the literary world, like I said, um, knew many important people, uh, had some wonderful sort of achievements um, in her own life. And yet, for both her and her work to be as forgotten as it is. So this really is a thrilling rediscovery and something rather special. Um, but before we get on to Kay Dick and talking about her life, I really wanna start with the novel itself, with They, um, because it is such a fascinating, strange and eerie piece of work. Um, so I wonder, could we get started perhaps if I asked you, Jay, to tell us a little bit about what you made of this work Work, and in what ways it spoke to you, both as a reader, I presume originally, but then also maybe as a writer as well. Yeah, um, well, thanks for uh, inviting me to this panel, first of all. Um, it is really, um, yeah, my, my pleasure. It's really, um, it is really uh, fascinating to kind of be introduced to this text, like via this. I did not know Kadic at all um, until I got the email saying, would you be interested? And then I saw the pronoun at the top and I was like this could be curious um and when I read it I my my initial reaction was this book is really weird and strange and disconcerting and I'm not sure what's happening and I'm gonna put it down now <laughs> maybe I'll come back to it later I I didn't have I had an immediate sense of of it being there being a, a, a psychological and an emotional undertone to the book that I found really unsettling. Um, and then when I when I went back to it, and when I mentioned it to other people, friends of mine, I was saying, I'm reading this really weird book. And you know, they were like, oh, what's going on? And I was like, every time I try to critique it or to put my finger on what it is that's going on, I can't quite do it. Um, because it's really complete and it does have this kind of 
conflicting uh, sort of center that, that's not quite there. Like it sort of kind of keeps unraveling the more I try to um, to try to grasp it. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a really like push pull relationship with it, and then the more I kind of like looked into it, and the more I, I read about her, the more it grew on me. Um, possibly because that there's just this sense of somebody who is very who's grappling with something grappling with something very large and very difficult and very dark that actually does uh, in its own way speak to me can I just ask after that it's made me wonder how do you describe it to people um because I have this problem all the time I say like I'm reading this brilliant book or there's this book you should read what how would you how can you sum up they in a few words do you think I don't know if I can do it in a few words. I don't think I can do it justice in, in a few words. I think it's, um, I, I, I guess the words that do come to mind are sort of circular mm. and and futility comes to mind as well. Um, and maybe like anguish, but I, I, I don't really know yet how to, um, yeah, summarize the book neatly. Um, and even calling it a dystopia, mm. I think is, this, it, it is a dystopia yeah it doesn't it doesn't quite fit into that category for me as well so I don't really know and I think that's okay like I, I'm trying not to rush into trying to um, put the book into a particular box mm, mm, excellent um, and Claire Louise can you sort of tell us uh, answer the same question like what were your first impressions when you came to this novel and um, what is it sort of what has it said to you so far one of the first things um, I was struck by was the Englishness of it. Mm. Um, I haven't lived in England for it's more than 20 years now. Um, so maybe I'm just quite sort of sensitive to those sorts of things. Um, but I wonder in a way if they were kind of deliberate, you know, these references to, um, well, there's just so much sunshine in it, sunshine throughout and big beautiful hydrangeas and picnics and boiled eggs a bit like Enid Blyton or something that's what made me think of and there are so many references throughout it to childhood you know so I did wonder if there was a sort of a deliberate evoking of those sorts of idyllic childhood landscapes um, and visions of you know the sea and how blue it is and the spray and I found that all very, very vivid um, and very, very, very melancholy in a way, because I suppose it's nostalgic. So that was one of the first things, I suppose, that I, I um, really noticed and really tuned into, kind of then more than any, any other aspect in a way, more, more, to, more that than they, really which is kind of interesting. And I don't really think of it as a, as a dystopian novel, particularly. For me, I think it's a novel about friendship. Mm. Um, that's how I've experienced it. Now, I think, I think I read it, well, I did read it after a novel called The Wall by Marlon Haushofer. And I read that again recently because I wrote an introduction to it. And Marlin Haushofer's book, The War, was written before they, it was written in maybe the 50s or the 60s, mm, somewhere around then. I, I should really know, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sometimes that's described as a, as a dystopian novel also, because uh, just briefly, the setup is, is that um, a woman goes to visit some friends in a hunting lodge in Austria, and her two friends go out to a restaurant for something to eat. And they don't come back. And in the morning, she's a bit confused and she goes out to see what's been going on. She goes for a walk and she kind of bumps her head and she realizes, she establishes that there's this invisible wall. And it goes on and on and everything behind it has been frozen completely. So she's the last woman left. Right. So there's this kind of, again, this kind of slightly sci fi, slightly dystopian kind of setup. But really what that is, is, is an elaborate kind of scenario that allows Marlon Haushofer then to explore what it is to be a woman living on your own. And in a way, I think there's something kind of similar here 
it's not that it's just a, a, a device. I don't, I don't mean that, but I don't think it's a, for me, I don't experience it as a, an allegory. Um, and I think it, it's, the depth of it for me comes from the exploration of the need to make contact with somebody and, and, and for friendship. And in every, um, in every variation, there's like, I don't know, six, seven chapters or variations on, on the theme. Um, somebody always offers their hand to somebody. There's always that phrase. And there's just this lovely thing throughout of hands being taken and hands being held. Um, and there's a real tenderness in it that I found very, very, very moving. And just to, and we talk about, about that because I'm interested to hear some of Natasha's memories of, of her when we kind of talk about that a bit later. But that, that aspect does interest me because of course, from what I know from her childhood, there were lots and lots of people around her as a child. It wasn't just this family unit. And there seems to be in this book an exploration of what it is to be a part of a, a larger network, a larger community. And this they seem to want to really instill this nuclear kind of family and for everyone to exist within these hermetic units, mm. which she never experienced herself. And she felt, she felt quite fortunate that, in fact, growing up, she had a much more extended sense of, of care and love. Um, and that can sometimes absolutely disappear as, as we get older. Um, so those are the things, really, that, that struck me. I find this so fascinating because I feel like every time I speak to anyone who's read they they take something kind of slightly different from it and that's one of the seems to be for me one of the, the genius elements of this of this novel. Um, Natasha can I come to you now I'd love to know what your thoughts are I'd love to know actually when you first read they I know that you know, just to give a background to our audience you grew up pretty much next door to Kadick didn't you in Brighton when you were she was living there when you were a child. Yeah um, I, I guess my earliest memories of her, I must have been around seven or something, six or seven, and um, until my teenage years when I then spent most of my time in London. But um, so I kind of lost touch with her then. But I think the only book I honestly remember was The Shelf um, coming onto our bookshelf, literally. Um, and and being slightly, you know, neglected or, or, or sort of, yes, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And I think I did try and read that as a teenager and, you know, couldn't make head nor tail of it. So I've come to this as an adult, um, they, and I, I read it the other week and um, I absolutely loved it. I was blown away by it. Of course, I think I was probably evidence finding and trying to sort of see all the parts of Brighton that I knew as a child that yeah. she was experiencing as she wrote it and maybe put in the book. So there's a tunnel in, in the book and, and, you know, all her descriptions of the beach. I sort of in the hydrangeas, I mean, she did have this sort of topiary, she had an incredible garden, she was a great gardener and she had a tiny, tiny basement sort of with window boxes and so forth. But my God, she thought it was like day of the Triffids. I mean, you couldn't even <laughs> see through the windows to walk past um, at the, the pavement. And I think that was intentional. She'd sort of buried herself under hydrangeas, um, like, a, like a sort of garden creature. And wow. um, you her working at her desk and the window was just behind the hydrangeas and if she was in a good mood and feeling social or if things were flowing she might wave and say hello and sort of lower her glasses and if things weren't going so well I don't know if I'm allowed to say this am I allowed to <laughs> she, she would literally to the kids we were on bikes and scooters and roller skates really annoying I'm sure screaming up and down the pavement which was obviously sort of just slightly above her eye line and very distracting I imagine but she would just say will you fuck off fuck off and, you know, we, of course, would be so excited by an adult telling us to fuck off that we'd sort of yeah, capitalise on that and go back the way we come and, yeah, see what we Continue do. to annoy her. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she's incredibly tight because she always, always forgive eventually. Um, but Brighton, that tunnel, the way she describes it, it's so vivid to me, the sort of um, the echoes and the gate at the end of it, all of those things are brilliantly beautifully inhabited and described and um I think to, to to Claire's point about that sort of 
not accepting the social construct that everyone else just assumes and takes for granted. And, and also you reading this in lockdown, it, it just struck me how extraordinary that must have been for you, that as people are getting fined to, if they leave their house at the wrong time or if they sort of have a gathering or if they're doing something that they're not meant to do, um, there's a sort of, you know, for completely different reasons, I suppose, but no, nonetheless, that we're living in this very, very strange time as, as you read it. Um, and the mirroring of that in the book is, it's spooky, um, to, to say the least. Um, and I, but I do think she didn't have um, a sort of, it's, it's not that she didn't respect the family unit. I mean, she did, she really loved my parents and, and she was very kind to my brother and I, but I mean, on our terrace, just coincidentally, I think my parents were amongst a handful of straight, couples in a sort of family unit most people were um either gay or we had you know two mothers raising a child we had a few single mothers we had um an actor next to us who who was gay but was married but and they were raising their grandchild i mean i mean there was no normal in inverted commas everyone had uh, their own sort of individual story and i think it, maybe it's no accident maybe it's an accident i don't know but she ended up in in that street and and didn't stand out as being peculiar or, or, or strange or, um, yeah, she, she absolutely inhabited her, her place within it and everyone had a story and um, didn't quite fit into what, you know, a, a social construct sort of married with 2.2 kids, which at that time was probably more normal. Mm -hmm. Hearing, um, I mean, coming to they then as an adult and having known her as a child, does it, as well as recognising these sort of elements of it that you can kind of translate into um, your knowledge of kind of Bright and things like that, does it make sense to you that she would have written this type of novel or does it kind of strike you as slightly left field and, and sort of a strange concoction? No, um the, the former this is exactly the kind of book it makes perfect sense it's like the last piece of the puzzle so it's interesting hearing you say that the early books which I haven't read which I'm really fascinated to read now um are are less are, are very different or mm. I, I, they feel like they're from a different writer that's really interesting because this seems absolutely completely what I would expect from her really on point and her sort of Again, I, you know, I don't want to project here because, as I say, I didn't have an adult. Um, I'm not looking at it through a, an adult portal. It was very much as a child. But, but then we did, she, you know, I'd go and visit her and I'd sit and, you know, she'd offer me sort of watered down Campari and crumpets. And as you were talking about the famous five thing or, or the Ina Blyton thing, it's absolutely true. There was always a sort of, you know, a scone with jam on it or, or, or the, the, these sorts of things that, my parents weren't particularly into that. I think, you know, my dad was sort of vegan into nut rissoles at that time, but Kay was very much into something quite traditional and it was Campari and soda at five o'clock and her cigarette holder and her monocle. And um, I think they, sat, they seemed to sound like their affectations, but they seemed very organic to her. And mm. she just was singular. I mean, her clothes, she she was like a, um, a sort of something out of um, Brideshead. I mean, as she modelled herself, on, on that she always sort of wore cricket jumpers with uh you know almost school colors on them and a sort of maybe a tie sometimes and this I always thought her hair was like Mr Whippy you know there was a sort of great curl <laughs> here and and it was this fabulous shock of blonde hair and this monocle and electric blue eyes and very very penetrating and sort of forensic in her analysis of people and um yeah and she spent a lot of time alone um and I I do think people underestimate what what, if you're a writer, so you're already leading quite a solitary existence. And on top of that, you live alone. So everything, every encounter you have is sort of organised by you or it's, it's constructed by you. You know, she wasn't in a community um, unless she sought it. And so that's, they makes perfect sense to me that there's a sort of incredible reverence for friendship and for constructing your own family, if you like, your chosen mm -hmm. family rather than your your family of origin or um, the, the one that you've made. I, I, I love that she sees, uh, and I suppose they're all creatives, aren't they? There is a, maybe maybe there's a sort of us and them thing around, I'm an artist and those people aren't and they don't understand. And, and I, I do recognise that as, as someone who um, 
I met as a child, she definitely seemed rarefied in that way. She was very cerebral and she didn't tolerate um, ignorance. She definitely didn't. Um, and she was a snob, um, but, but not a snob in a sense of, uh, you know, money, class, anything to do to do with status it was all to do with yeah curiosity and mm. um, whether it, whether you could be bothered to read actually mm. I think, yeah I'd love to talk a little bit more about um the importance of friendship I think in this novel I, as, as everyone sort of rightly pointed out this seems to be quite a key thing like love um sort of affection between people romantic or just uh friendship wise is very very important in this in this novel um and i think you're it's been rightly pointed out that sort of dystopia maybe takes the uh takes the edge off that perhaps but i know that both claire louise and jay had talked um just in the green room beforehand had both mentioned that this was something that kind of struck them about the book and that and particularly about um some of Kay's other work i don't know if one of you wants to jump in and tell me which who, which of you was talking about ivy and stevie remind me the yeah it was you jay wasn't it so can you maybe explain to our audience what ivy and stevie the book is and and, and explain why we were going to talk about this um yeah so ivy and stevie is a sort of um it's a very thin book with two essay two um interviews and then two essays and essentially, um, Kay had sort of taken it upon herself to interview them both um, very casually and informally. And there's a few sort of... Um, so this is Ivy Compton Burnett. Sorry to interrupt you, I'm just sorry, clarifying. No, I'm just realising we haven't actually told anyone. <laughs> of course, yeah, sorry. It's Ivy Compton Burnett and Stevie Smith, isn't it? Is that exactly, right? Yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so Kay had just sort of taken it upon herself to sort of interview them both and to do it in a way that was sort of not journalistic, not not the way that a newspaper journalist would do it. So they sort of just sort of sit and they just talk and then she kind of edited them down mm. and they both died and she put out this sort of book as a, in, in memory of them both and then wrote these two sort of lovely little essays which sort of examine them both as people and I think I thought that was really interesting um, as, as I was reading I mean there's a couple of things I want to say about love as well but I think it's interesting because this book to me when I read it I did not see it as as something about friendship and love it's, it's so interesting I, I if, if anything I interpreted it as almost the the opposite I saw it as a as a desire for something that isn't there mm. um, and it's interesting to me because the they are kind of described as sort of imposing community mm. on on the artists, and the artists are actually yearning for individuality and and so on. So I think there's I'm not I don't think that friendship isn't is is absent from that, but I think it's a very conflicted form. It's a it's a, it's a, it's almost like a longing for it's a longing to relate rather than an examination of of relating, do you know what I mean? Like I feel yeah. like there's, and the fact that, that all of these people have different names each time and the, the, the protagonist is unnamed and so on, it's, it, it seems really conflicted to me. And, and as I was reading Ivy, um, Ivy and Stevie, I noticed that in both conversations, she really does come to love. Like she she brings it up as something that she, she wants to talk about. Um, I'll just give you like two little, little sections. So when she's talking to Ivy, she says, it seems to me that in your books, love often changes a character's whole way of morality and then when she's talking to stevie she says i want to ask you about love and then stevie smith says you've asked me about love i don't know it was i just i just thought her kind of insistence on this topic was like spoke volumes actually um because it, it to me it what it betrays is both a fascination with other people and a desire for other people and a longing for other people, but also a kind of a deep loneliness and perhaps fear of other people as well, which is definitely the thing, the thing I took away from, from reading they. That's really fascinating. What about you, Claire Louise? You've also have been quite interested in some of her literary interviews, haven't you? Yeah, I was, um, I was reading uh, the one with Bridget, uh, Rofi mm. and Maureen Duffy um, and then at the end of that collection 
she, she's written an essay, uh, an autobiographical piece called On, on Friends and, and Friendships. Um, and she talks about, well, she talks about, you know, when she was, when she was born, quite good, I like this bit. So I'll just read this little bit out actually. Yeah, um, so, so this was, um, sometime before my conception, my mother came to London from Cambridge where she was living with a view to going on the stage, an action which alienated her from her sister's husbands. Her pregnancy was the final cutting of the family bond. She had friends, yes, she had friends, bohemians, she called them, artists, actresses, demi-mondaine, met penniless, the lot of them. She knew where to find them at the Café Royale, and indeed, that is where my mother and I made our way after, so she told me, a wash and brush up in a Charing Cross lady's lavatory. So my first evening in the world was very mundane, very gregarious. Small wonder that I have a taste for cafe life. The Bohemians did not let us down. They fetted us. Someone must have paid for our drinks. Toasts and blessings were exchanged and much sound advice about the problems of the world given to my small ears by three sophisticated ladies. One being a famous artist's model whose red hair adorns his most lavish paintings. I am sure we all had a splendid night out and that I was made much of, which doubtless accounts for the trust I have in people. It was to my mind an extremely fortunate first view of the world. I must early have imbibed that friendliness which exists among those whose security is not threatened by the inhibitions of status. So I thought that was very interesting um, as, a, as a very early experience. And she talks about her babyhood, you know, <laughs> she's lovely. No one talks about their babyhood. Um, but I mean, that's quite something if that's your first night in the world. And it seems like throughout then that, that this, this idea of, of, of friendship, I mean, no, I don't suppose it was something that she was kind of, um, uh, you know, I, idealistic about, or you, um, what's the word? A bit kind of rose tinted about. It seems like a, it was an ongoing kind of uh, project, or or a lifelong kind of. Uh, um, I don't know. Something she she was kind of conscious of, mm. um, as as a um, yeah, an ongoing practice, I suppose. Um, I mean, again, she says, my mother's simple explanations about the other people in our early life did teach me that listening and observing were rewarding occupations. So there was a kind of, uh, yeah. A, and then there's a, there's, a, there's a piece in there somewhere where she's talking about her stepfather and they reach a point where they're not really getting on anymore. She's in her later adolescence. And of course, you know, things start getting a bit tricky around, around that stage. So even though up until that point, it's all been quite lovely and charming. And she spent time in Switzerland and after a few years in boarding school, which weren't great. But then there reaches a point where I, he kind of says, you know, at some point you're going to have to go out and earn a living. And that's the moment we all kind of dread and think, oh God, you know, what's that, what's that going to involve? That's just going to be kind of grim. So she's kind of a bit prickly then and, and they're not getting on too well. And it seems they didn't get on really at all well. I don't know just based on this. And then she said in later life, she kind of felt bad about that. You know, there was just this kind of gap and she wasn't at that stage very aware of what was going on in, in his life. So I kind of found her ability to sort of maybe look back and, and maybe reassess certain attitudes that she had to people and kind of go, oh, actually, yeah, maybe I was a bit harsh there. You know, I mean, mm. we can all be, I mean, I've been quite horrendous with some people. And I think that, you know, because you just, you put, especially when you're younger, you're just working from a particular place or if you're spending a lot of time on your own mm. or whatever, I mean, you can't always keep perspective maybe. But it that ability, I think, to look, to look back and, 
and to make that assessment and say, well, there was a kind of a generation gap and it's a shame. And she says that really what's needed to, 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 to counter those gaps and to counter those misunderstandings is dialogue, is conversation. So it's not always necessarily about getting on, but at least it's about just being aware of what other people are experiencing so that you're not mean to them, I suppose, or not too mean to them too often. Yeah, I can see you nodding along, Jay. Do you have um, something, do you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, actually, um, I think that phrase you just used, working from a particular place, really resonates um, with me because what it does then is it gets at what's underneath the novel, <laughs> like what's 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 going on underneath the story. Um, mm. I think the subtext of this story is 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 the kind of um, the background and the history and the experience and the whatever that then informs one's behaviour. So to me, reading this literally, not that we have, but to read it as a dystopia or as, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a literal kind of idea of the world or something like that makes less sense when you think about it as actually it's about how you relate to other people and the place that you're coming from. And that place, I think, is why it's so strange like that like one of my favorite sections for example is um pebble of unease which even as a title is like really cool like I just I just love that as a title but in it it's that section where um they're walking together and then there's hordes of people coming down the south oh, with all their sticks and things yeah now what is going on in that section <laughs> it's, it's definitely my favorite bit of the book I think because I just read it and was like it's poetic in the sense of it's an image. It's an image that is the effect of something else, right? There's something else kind of going on and the, examining the image alone isn't gonna give you any clear answers. You know what I mean? It's actually the kind of like patching together of all of these separate different things and kind of like looking at them from different angles that gives you a sense of a whole, but on its own, it's really unsettling and really strange. I almost feel like I'm kind of coming at friendship from a, a very unsettled place. <laughs> You're kind of coming at it from a kind of, you know, it's, it's a good thing or whatever. And that's maybe why she, why why her work, why, why this work resonates with me, because like you, um, you know, like you, Claire, I've also had a lot of trouble with friendships and with relationships. And I think this is a book on that subconscious level can really resonate. I think... Um if I may sort of jump in just briefly, I'm just thinking so much about how important reading Friends and, or the interviews in Friends and Friendship and Ivy and Stevie were to my understanding of what was going on in Bay, that initially my first kind of response to the book was so much like this is a sort of strange dystopian tale for want of a better way of describing that kind of book, let's put it that way. But the more I read it, the more I started thinking this is a book that is very much, or it seemed to me very much about Kadic, the writer and the way that she engages with people and what she loves in terms of art and spending time with people and talking with people and um, that sort of love that she has for her friends, which seemed to, I'm not saying it was always very straightforward, but seemed to sort of come through in those, uh, in those interviews that she, she did. And one of the things I think Claire, which you made me, um, sorry, Claire Louise, that you made me realize while you were talking about it just then was that how one of the wonderful things I think about those interviews is the way that she, as much as she puts her subjects under the spotlight, she is always referring back to herself as well. She's very interested in how she has become the person she is and the friend she is, right? Like that's something she keeps sort of referentially going back to and thinking, how am I the person? I mean, it's very telling that she ends Friends and Friendship with an essay, a sort of memoir essay, right? Well, yeah, I suppose there is that, that idea that you are, um, made of your interactions with other people. Yeah. You know, you're not just... Um, uh, that's a brilliant way of putting it. I mean, I think that's the impression <laughs> I got of her yeah. as, a, as a person, is that she, her interactions with other people, are, and particularly with her friends, because they seem to be of such kind of priority in her life. They're the ones mm. that give her um, at least sort of some of her sense of identity and, and you know, self-identity. Mm. 
Are we yeah. talked I don't know Natasha would you because you had some very interesting things to say about because I suppose we should maybe just briefly mention I don't know how much people are aware of this but you know and I think you'll talk about this much more eloquently Natasha but so Kay Dick had when she was living in London she was sort of at the very heart of this London literary scene in Hampstead she lived with her partner Kathleen Fowle for many years and they knew um everybody you know the people she interviews are her friends um everyone you know she was friends with Muriel Spark she was friends with Bridget Brophy she was friends with um Ivy Compton Burnett and Stevie Smith and then she moves to Brighton and this is a very different stage in her life isn't it and you have some brilliant things to say about this Natasha I think well first of all can I just go back to Jay's point which is so astute about the pebble because um there's a sort of loneliness, I think, in this book that, that you talk about a yearning, I think is the word you used, I can't remember. But the pebble, I absolutely agree, that struck me, that it brought back this shard of, of, of memory where I'd sit in her, her house, her, her flat was a room. It was a studio room. She had the bed and she had a desk by the window, as I said, and sort of two chairs either side of the other window and then a mantelpiece. And um, on the mantelpiece were these pebbles that she collected on the beach. And they were like this little row of beautiful pebbles, but they were her friends. And I mean, I remember quite often as a kid saying, can I, can I borrow that one or can I take that one? Because there were things I used to play with. And she'd say, no, absolutely not. <laughs> um, and uh, I just, and I'd, I'd forgotten about the pebbles until I read the book. It just, it, it, this vision came back to me. And she had a game of solitaire that was made out of sea glass. Um, so they're all sort of things from the beach, which again, you know, keeps coming up in the book a sort of attachment to um, just, yeah, her, her natural surroundings, the sort of landscape. I feel there's a lot of landscape in that book. And it, it was true for her. She had a dog, either Sonny or Timmy. They were always Dachshunds. And she used to sort of, they would, that's what would get her outside in the morning, if you like, because I, I do think she, I don't know if she suffered from depression, but she definitely, um, well, yeah, she, 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 she was lonely and sad some of the time. But um in terms of your um what you were asking sorry Lucy uh, no no that's all brilliant about um her, her place in our street was as, as I think I said it was quite an eclectic bunch of people um she really didn't have any money um as far as I remember um but as I said was always turned out immaculately that was very important to her um and I don't know am I allowed to share a couple of little notes that please she, do um, sent to my parents that just they tickle me and also they're her words so it will uh, represent her much more accurately than, than I ever could so um the first one is it's just a little card um and and these were very regular by the way she she would put things through the post box and I think to all the neighbors I don't think it was my parents particularly but this is definitely how she she didn't have a television or obviously a computer just a, a typewriter and and books and her wall there were there was no space for paint on her walls it was just shelves and shelves and shelves of books. Um, and to that point, she would lend her books to people and then get very angry if they didn't return them. So one, one of them is, um, Dear Roy, um, that, that's my stepdad. Dear Roy, um, this card is sent to all long-term book borrowers to show them what happens to those who offend. I have had an eye operation, which is a nuisance. I don't know if you can see the card. It's of a pottery figure in the Brighton Museum of a soldier being attacked by a tiger can everyone see this mm -hmm. brilliant and um <laughs> uh, anyway i don't think my dad took very much notice of the card because um here's another plea um noreen and roy i wonder if you'd mind returning to me my copy of bruce chatwin's in patagonia which you borrowed over a year ago um, <laughs> these things would keep coming back and then there's another one which um she wrote uh, uh um, and this, uh, I think this is, a, this says quite a lot about um, what someone else was talking in reference to how she treated people or how she was constructed by um, how she related to people or, or her actions. And, and um, so soon after, so she'd, um, she'd asked my father uh, for some help with, a, a reviewer had written something um, unpleasant about about her and he, she sort of asked him to intercept and I think he'd failed because you know she accused him of being a people pleaser and just being nice to everyone anyway she she said um 
Well, Roy dear, Noreen and Tasha are correct. You are a softie. In some ways, that's a good point, meaning, of course, that in other ways, it's not at all a good point. Um, you should not have hesitated to tell me exactly how matters stood as far as I was concerned with the Sunday Times reviewing. As to my being difficult, may I just make a few points? I do not consider myself to be difficult and have had, in the main, extremely good relations with various literary editors. I think, if I may say so, that when I do produce, um, I produce good work. Certainly, I am ever careful of facts, opinions, on which over the years I have been proved right, and to do my homework more than is probably necessary. I realise that my procrastination is partly due to the fact that in some ways I want to stop reviewing, i.e. small pieces easily forgotten, and concentrate on producing books, which is really my metier. Lack of money urges me to go on battling on the reviewing front. But I, I think, to, to her point, she was so thorough and assiduous and would reread if, if she'd sort of she she could quote um most of the books that she'd read um and also my parents recollection is she she would read the whole of a writer or, or an author she would never sort of make an opinion on the basis of one book she would then visit four others so that's that's the rare the generosity towards other writers i think is mm -hmm. something of course, I wasn't aware of as a kid, but looking back and looking at various things and letters that she'd written to my parents, you know, she took everyone's writing very, very seriously. She spent an inordinate amount and perhaps, you know, is a form of avoidance or procrastination of actually having to put pen to paper yourself. But nonetheless, the byproduct of that is, is that she was incredibly generous about other people's writing and contributions and endeavours. Um, that's something that seems to come up quite a lot. There were um, letters sent to The Guardian in defense of her after that kind of terrible obituary was published. And one of the things that was um, talked about was her complete generosity towards particularly younger writers, I think, um, and helping how she would help them. And this is what I've heard people have told me over and over again, that she was incredibly supportive of other people's work, uh, that she might, even if she wasn't particularly you know fond of what they'd written she would kind of defend them to the hills to, in front of other people which is actually an incredibly kind of rare gift and she did but I imagine it's something that was honed um, perhaps during her sort of editorial years I mean she spent quite a long mm. time working as an editor beforehand something we haven't really mentioned we haven't had the time yet but she was the first female director of an English publishing house she edited yeah do you want to talk Jay? Um, not, not to interrupt you please actually no 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 that a little bit but but, but I, I sort of get the feeling that, you know, it's, it, she, she was queer, right? She was she, we're talking about a queer writer here, we're talking about somebody who probably rubbed people up the wrong way <laughs> by, <laughs> by existing. Um, right. You know, Natasha, when you describe the, the hair and the eyes and even the monocle, like the monocle is such a old school classic indication of of queerness and, and, of, and of a certain sort of masculine identity, uh, butch even, identity. Um, and I also read that obituary and thought, okay, it sounds like she probably did alienate people. I don't actually think that, you know, I don't think it's a very good thing to speak so ill of the dead in a national newspaper, but <laughs> even if she did alienate people um, and, and upset them and so on. Well, I can see why. I could. I can imagine that she. she you know, you're a queer woman. You're one of the first literary editors in this country. Even in 2001, this country was incredibly homophobic, um, and and still is in some ways. You know, so it, it it sounds to me like she was somebody who had to be, had to be, grating and 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 brusque sometimes. Do you think this is also one of the reasons? Sorry, Natasha, were you going to say something? No, I was only going to say just to, to bring it down to a really base level, <laughs> having spoken so eruditely. Um, I do remember as a kid being confused about her, not sexuality, but her gender. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember saying to her as a little kid um, with my mum standing next to me, going stone like and squeezing my hand um, until I squealed um I, I said to Kay I Kay I would always call her Kay Dick by the way which is also interesting <laughs> she was known as you know which is, is, a, is a kind of great name anyway particularly for who she was but it was never Kay which sounds quite sort of I don't know a little more feminine there was mm. it was Kay 
her name. And I said, Kay Dick, Kay Dick, I've got a question for you. And she said, what, what, what? And she was trying to talk to my mum. And, um, and I said, are you a man or a woman? And she thought about it and she said, I have the best of both worlds, Tasha. Mm -hmm. And which was a very elegant response. And she carried on talking to my mum. And then I, you know, pulled on her jumper again. I said, no, 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 no. I mean, do you have a willy like mine or like my brother's? <laughs> just Your stupid. poor mother. <laughs> wanted to disown you immediately like, but yeah I, in there was no self-consciousness um about her she that there, there was she was totally unapologetic um about or or, or defensive is really what i mean there, there was no she just was as she was and um i don't you know i never remember her talking about being a woman, actually, I, I can never, you, you know, and often to a young girl and an, an old woman might reference, uh, you know, specifically solely female experiences, or even if it's down to biology or whatever. She never ever did. I never, I never remember her being uh, specific about any of that, which of course is really liberating. Um, yeah, Jay, were you can add something. Just, just that um, I, I was sort of hunting for references to you know to queerness to lesbianism as well and to you know womanhood and, and all of this and in um in Ivy and Stevie I did notice that there was one single line that I remember uh, in which she says that um that I think Ivy despite being deeply conservative in many ways did approve of the Wolfenden report and that was it and the Wolfenden wow. report, of course, was the report that came before the uh, the decriminalised, partial decriminalisation of homosexuality. Um, and that was it. That was the sole line. And I thought there was something really interesting about the placement of that line that was so pointed and yet understated, um, which sounds kind of like how she probably was in the world as well. But also this, this question where she says, what I mentioned earlier, it seems to me that in your books, love often changes a character's whole way of morality there's a kind of a, a, a subtext to that i sometimes feel like she's asking questions that she herself is asking you know i'm conscious that we are getting towards the end of our time but i would like to briefly in particular talk a little bit about how or whether we think this is a particularly english book i'm very interested in this idea because claire louise you gave a a lovely um, quote, you called this a masterwork of English pastoral horror, eerie and, I can't even speak today, eerie and bewitching, which I loved. I think it captures so much about it, but I'm really fascinated by this idea of the Englishness of they. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd love to know some of your thoughts on this, everyone. Um, do you, I don't know, Claire, would you like to, sorry, Claire Louise, would you like to start and kick us off a little well, bit? Well, yeah, I mean, as I said at the beginning, I was struck by the Englishness of it. Um, yeah. Um, because I haven't I haven't lived there for quite a long time. I'm, and like you say, the seed cakes, the tea, there's so many kind of um, signifiers of quite oh, it's traditional kind of funny. I just found it, and I found that all a bit kind of funny and a bit eccentric, really. Um, and, I'm, I, and I was doing, I've been doing a bit of research on Leonora Carrington again um, for a theatre thing I'm, I'm involved in, and it sort of, it kind of reminded me of Leonora Carrington in a way, mm. the way that when she she moved away from England and she lived in Mexico for a very very long time, but that um, that English way of life was still part of her imagination and and she took a lot of enjoyment in depicting uh, certain I suppose tropes um, of English life and sort of relished them and enjoyed them in in a in a kind of um, I suppose almost camp kind of way to a degree. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think there's a little bit of that going on in they definitely, but then there's also I, I would yeah, kind of I suppose situate, situate it in a sort of a tradition of um, the you know English pastoral um, it sort of. There's a story I read many many years ago. Is it M R M R James of you from a hill? Hmm. Um, it's a, he's got some binoculars or something, and there yeah, Jay seems to know it well. <laughs> they're bewitched or something and you and the guy looks through them and he sees um you know because it's all sprawling beautiful countryside it's southwest of England I think and he's gone out for this walk and he looks through these binoculars and because they don't give it away don't give it away oh yeah okay <laughs> um 
anyway, it it um it kind it kind of made me think of that uh, story that I won't meant to talk about anymore. Um, <laughs> because the English, the, growing up, the English, you know, the English countryside, it is, it is obviously it's, it's almost um, unnervingly, unnervingly kind of glorious and beautiful. And, and there's always places like, I remember a place called Goa, Gallows Hill. And there was um, like a wooden frame and we used to drive past it on a country lane called White Ladies Lane. And there was a kind of a, and it was the remains of a, a, a gibber, stuff like that, you know, that you would, that you would see. And, um, and lots of that land would have been, I suppose, battlefields or, um, and then also growing up where I was, we were very near um, RAF bases. So there was a, a sense of, I remember during the Gulf War kind of claims and, so there was always that duality to it, you know, yeah. as well as being kind of pastoral and bucolic and, and beautiful. There was always this kind of secondary thing, like, you know, yeah, the this, this skull beneath the soil kind, mm. of, kind of vibe that was going on. And, and, and so I suppose in a sense, and that's been explored by any number, I'm thinking of like, um, well, Kate Bush, some of Kate Bush's songs, like Experiment 4 and Cloud Busting and all that sort of thing. And, some of Ben Wheatley's films, you know, um, kind of explore, and of course the Wicker Man, and there's always been that sort of. Um, yeah, it's suddenly making me think of folk horror in a way that I actually had. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, it before. is. I mean, she talks about you know this crucifix made of seaweed in, yeah. in one of the part. I can't remember the bit that's left on the doorstep. I mean, a crucif crucifix of seaweed. It's kind of funny, but it's also kind of like, ooh. Yeah, yeah you don't want to find it on <laughs> I mean, your doorstep. It's brilliant! It's such a brilliant image. I, I loved that. I was like, wow, it, it sort of, um, yeah, funny and a bit horrible as well. Yeah. Um, it also made me think a little bit about what you were saying, Jay. It's like some of the, those sort of images, like you were saying, Claire Louise, like they stand for so much, something like that, that crucifix kind of carries so much different weight with it. But I'm also thinking about what you said, Jay, about the writing being so poetic on so many levels that, you know, Gay Dick was a poet as well. I think the very first thing she ever published was some poetry. Um, and we probably shouldn't forget that about her. And I'd love to know from one poet to the other, that is that what you noticed particularly when you, do you notice that in the writing? Did you kind of think this is particularly poetic writing? And if so, what, did, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um... It, it is poetic. What you mentioned her earlier novels and how mannered they are. And I sort of had a look at them and I sort of thought, yeah, these, these do feel like a sort of a world apart, like she's doing something very different. Yeah, they're completely kind this, of alien. Completely alien. Yeah. Um, even the sort of historical stuff, I was like, okay, this is, yeah, this is maybe coming closer. But um, I suppose when I say that it's, it's poetic, I mean, it's um, it is operating in the, in the spaces. Um, you know, she is not simply saying X and Y Z happened. No, mm. it's a little machine that is allowing you to enter into a different space, uh, a different a different psychological space, a different emotional space, and in some ways a different political space. I think um, you know, Claire, Claire Louise was saying about um, the Englishness. I would say probably the defining aspect of, of the Englishness for me is the, is the class differential between the, the, the artists in the enclave and the, and the they, who um, I think are classed as, as being working class, as being sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, rough and, and um, uncouth, you know, like you almost get that kind of sense from them. But also that the English countryside is a site of of, of horrific um, land dispossession. I think we, we really forget that. Um, people were forced off, off the land into industrial industrial centers, you know, in clo the Enclosures Act, um, things like that. And that, that was a, a, a brutal decades long, over, over the course of a century and a bit, um, campaign of, of, against humanity really and against the kind of the, the rights and the, the culture and the history and the dignity of the people who've been attached to that land um, and I think that's part of where the horror comes from on that on that um, 
on that uh, subconscious, on that subconscious level, and also why I think her work is so poetic because it it touches that. Like I feel like that bleeds through the grass, so to speak. So you know, as you as you squelch down into this novel, you're squelching into blood, but that's not. It's it's implicated without that much comment to put it to put it one way. I love that squelching down into the novel. More novels should give you. That's the kind of brilliant, a brilliant, you know, that's I think that's one of the great things about this novel is that it it allows you to do that, to really kind of engage with it on all these multiple levels and to kind of find something new each time as you read it, considering it's such a, a slight book. Um, we've got some questions. I could keep asking uh, keep asking you questions of my own, but what I'm going to do is shift to the audience questions now and we'll see how many of those we can get through, I think, if we may. Um, so I'm just looking at my tablet over here. We have one from Sarah, oh, this is an interesting one, it, oh, very good. Do you think that there is a literary inheritor of they? Is there a recent book that you can see in they shadow? I find this fascinating because I keep thinking like what other books is they like and is there anyone writing about it today? Um, who wants to take this question? We put on the spot. <laughs> anyone, any ideas? Um, I didn't. I didn't have a recent one that was exactly the same. Mm, go for it anyway. Uh, I, 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 I did think I had two sort of thoughts. One yeah, was yeah. around. Um, it was around sort of Octavia Butler, not because of, um, not because it's sort of formally the same, or because I think the writing is is particularly similar, but just because of the us and them dynamic in, in the parable of the sower, for example, where the, those in the in the kind of enclave are, oh, yes. that's weird. Um, those within the, within the enclave are, sorry, I'm, sorry, just something just came up in my, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> right. Those within the enclave is, is kind of where the story is kind of set. And then there's the people outside of it who are the kind of, um, the kind of villains of the story and I felt like there was something kind of in that sort of in, in, encirclement or encampment or, uh, that, that kind of resonated a little bit with that um, but I think the book that actually like made me think about they is this book um, which is by Anna Caban I don't know if you've anyone yeah cool. I think it's, it's slightly you know in the screen you can't see it it's oh, yeah. white on the screen <laughs> exactly which one is um, it I, it's ice ice yeah and I, I've got to thank Ben Rivers. We've been working together and he kind of mentioned it to me um, and said that, you know, like it's probably one to read. And I think it really does put the book into context, especially in the terms of like English science mm. fiction and so on. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was my kind of two cents. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. To. I think I agree with Ice. That was the first thing that I thought of when I read it. And then there are obvious you know, similarities between, you can think of the um, the they as slightly similar to the book Burning Firemen in something like Fahrenheit 451. There's those sorts of dystopian elements, but I think Ice is a great one in terms of the slightly strangeness of it. And uh, I don't know, Claire Louise, Natasha, can you think of anything? I was just thinking about strangeness and sort of, um, I guess, yeah, it's overused, but, you know, the dystopian element. Has anyone read a book um, by Karen Jennings called An Island? No. Um, it was, um, I think, on the long, long book list. I actually can't remember. Uh, oh, was it last year? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I do. I haven't read it, but I know the one you're talking about. Okay, yeah. is that quite similar? Or got similar elements, let's say? It, it's not similar. I couldn't say it was similar, but there's something... You don't know where it is. It's um, it's it's sort of extraordinary, but and and you it's disquiet. You you feel very uncomfortable <laughs> when you're reading it. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's different in that it's about you know a body that gets washed up and um. Uh, um it's 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 you know really only two characters but mm. but they're, they're representative of um wider populations i guess and one one's um a, um a refugee um but anyway it's yeah that's great flavor. yeah 
that's some good recommendations there. I like that. We've got a few more questions here. Um, what, uh, this is one for you, Natasha. Sorry to stick with you. Could you single out, uh, Jane Henry is asking, could you single out one enduring memory of Kay? One particular memory of all of them? That's a tricky question, probably a tricky ask. Well, there's an interesting thing, I, and I don't want to be disruptive here because I noticed that in some of the retaliation about that um, obituary, uh, there's a narrative that I think even my stepdad is partly responsible for, is that the, she loved young people. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know I thought, um, she loved animals and she loved um, certain people. Um, and but she was selective. So part of her charm, I think, is if she did give you attention, and when she did give you attention, she gave you all of her attention. Mm -hmm. You really felt you were in the only person in the room. Um, therefore, it was very rewarding. I don't think she was one of those people who just sort of, you know, ran up to children and toddlers and, and uh, befriended them. She really didn't. Um, she was, yeah, she was in her own imaginative hinterland. I now realise that when I look back. Um, she was struggling and wrestling with ideas and uh, wanting to get them down on paper and that was a massive struggle for her mm. um, some of the time and so I think yeah so someone else said earlier on what um, I, th I think it was you Claire Louise but when you talked about you know the, the place that you're coming from um, whether that's so so, so it, it's it's so lovely to revisit as an adult her writing and to understand that what may have seemed like crankiness and um, just rudeness at so much of the time was really just because she was in a very solitary place wrestling with her demons and you caught her mid conversation in her mind and um, yeah that's deeply annoying it's like catching waking someone out of a dream I I often felt that about her you you had to be very careful. It was sort of walking on eggshells. He didn't quite know which K. Dick you were going to meet. Um, but that's not to say that there was anything, um, you know, intrinsically horrible about her. There wasn't at all. Mm. It was, um, it's, she's just a great example of someone who's chosen the road less traveled, I suppose. Um, mm. And the cost, you know, the, the, the price of that. Mm. Thank you. There's another question here, which um, I want, I think Claire Louise, actually, I might ask you to just refer back to what you were speaking about earlier because it was so eloquent, but um, Philip asked what we, what we can learn from Kay Dick's early life. And I think what you were saying earlier, particularly about some of her recollections of her birth and the kind of slightly strangeness of her, the sort of strangeness of her upbringing, perhaps. What do you think um, learning about that has, has sort of added to your understanding of Kay Dick's work and particularly they? Um, well, I mean, I, it's only, it's, I've only been delving into the, the autobiographical aspect just very um, recently, mm. but, um, but just that sense of, uh, as, as I said, I suppose being, um, just being among, among people and it, and it, um, it reminds, it reminds us, it reminds me, I guess, how, I mean, I love my solitude very, very much. Um, but it is important if one is going to be empathic um, and compassionate and all of those things that are kind of important if, um, if we're going to understand, I suppose, understand beyond our, ourselves and beyond the own reach of our experience. Um, that it is necessary to, to move among other people and and to remember the importance of of listening and as Natasha said you know paying paying attention um, and and it is and obviously she did struggle sometimes with balancing that as as we all do because she also said that she loved to daydream mm -hmm. um, and and loved that time on her own to just so, and it can be quite difficult sometimes because like that, if you get caught at a moment and you are likely to tell someone to fuck off, 
just not empathic or compassionate or kind. <laughs> but it's very human, <laughs> I think. Um, so, so from what I'm discovering of of her so far, um, it, it's it's kind of it resonates and it feels quite sort of realistic, um, really. Yeah, very interesting. But I'm I'm curious as to kind of where the book came out of because as as has been mentioned, her previous books weren't really anything like it. So mm. it is interesting to think, to wonder what it was that really just sort of came together for her. Um because it doesn't feel contrived or forced or like she's copying anyone. I mean, a, a kind of um, I suppose it does remind me, not not so much of the um Anna Coven, I, I, I couldn't get that parallel so much, but certainly some of Anne Quinn's work, mm. just in terms of the style, I suppose, rather than maybe the subject matter, then maybe that's what you were associating with Anna Coven. But I, the style, I think, for me. Um, so I don't know whether she was aware of, of her work. And I know that she says in, in this piece something about after Muriel Sp Spark was, was ill, and she and she wrote a couple of maybe extraordinary books in in a slightly different uh, in a slightly different way. And whether I don't know was she, was she maybe ill prior to writing they or something. I'm not I'm not quite sure of the of the timelines. But I wonder if that. I'm just curious about what what. Yeah, if something had happened. I mean, I think this is the sort of occurred. the speculation. I think so far is that possibly um, she went through a period of about ten years where she wasn't writing fiction. She was only writing those books of interviews and a non-fiction book um, uh, that was very different. And during that time, she definitely suffered some uh, quite sort of considerable losses. Her, her relationship with Kathleen Farrow, who she'd been going out with for sort of 20 years, broke up. She moved to Brighton. She also tried to kill herself at one point. Right. And she had a, a lover who also committed suicide. And these are things that she writes about in um, that essay in Friends and Friendship. And I think my reading of it was definitely colored by that, that she seemed to sort of emerge on the other side and be writing something completely different. Like she's shed her skin almost and is, is coming out at you. And I think that's also why particularly it reminded me of Anna Kavan because she had that amazing sort of midlife move as well. Like she had, you know, she developed her heroin addiction, left her husband and became this kind of emaciated bottle blonde and, and wrote these incredible books that were very different to the ones that she'd first written. So there seems to be something in the, I don't know, in the water, in the air at that time of the, of the sort of these particular, there just seems to be a few women who've kind of undergone that, but it, obviously something in her life really changed for her during that time, which I think does make it particularly intriguing for me, at least mm -hmm. as a kind of reader. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that in our last mm -hmm. few minutes. Dropping that in there, <laughs> sorry. We have one, I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm gonna push this right to the very end. We have one question here um, that is asking, which is interesting because in a way I started out by talking about this book as a dystopia and then you all swiftly undercut me and said that was not the point of it, which is brilliant to hear <laughs> in many ways. Um, but somebody has asked, they have neglected to give their name, but they um, have asked, why are we reading dystopian works uh, today in this day and age when the world is already dystopian enough and um, I think that is a kind of interesting question maybe to end on that one of the things about this book that does seem to be that it is talking to people now in a way that it might not have talked to people at the time I'd love to know asking you very quickly what if anyone's got any thoughts on that you know the um maybe just leave it like the New Yorker last week wrote a wonderful piece about the discovery of this book but um, their writer Sam Knight said it's taken global misfortune and some sliding towards the abyss for they to speak fully and to be heard there does seem to be something about now it's a fortuitous discovery but something about this book does seem to speak to people does anyone have any final thoughts on that I just have one really quick thought which is I think if this book was written now the presence of sort of victimhood would be much more um, front and center and okay. I think the thing about Kay Dick was for all of her paranoia or, or yearnings or wanting attention that perhaps she didn't get and soliciting um, commissions and so forth I, I didn't never got a feeling from the things that she sent to my parents or my experience of her that um, there was that she was a victim uh, and and I 
I do I do think that's a difference. I don't know if that's useful in any way, but um, I think she felt she, she, she did have agency um, mm. and, and she could have easily fallen into a category of, I mean, given all the, you know, the prejudice that, that would have existed at that time. Mm. I, I, I never, ever, she seemed to rise above and beyond it and just see it as irrelevant, just, you know, she wasn't, wasn't going to give it the time of day. And that's quite inspiring. It's incredibly inspiring. I think that's, does any, I mean, I feel like that's the perfect way to draw this to a close, unless anyone has anything burning to add. Please do say now. Yeah, no, please do, Jay. I, I was going to say, if the, the question we um, smacks a little bit a certain kind of um, finger wagging kind of disapproval and I think we the, the book itself is about it asks the fundamental question of what does it mean to make art for no one mm. um that's what coming on and Milton Charlie says at least in the thing I think that's a really good way of, of kind of putting it the idea that we don't read books because we don't think that they are permissible in the current world that we're in is precisely why we need to read those books. <laughs> you know, we need to get beyond that, that, yeah. that mentality. Mm. That's great. I think there's no better place to end it than that then. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I have had a wonderful discussion. It's been great to talk to you all and to hear his Molly back to it. still close. Thank you so much, Jay, Claire Louise, Natasha and Lucy. If this evening's conversation has inspired you at home to read or rediscover they, you can buy your copy from the British Library shop. And I think there's a button on your screen, one of these directions um, so that you can buy it now. Uh, or if you go to the RSL's bookshop.org page, you can find books by our speakers this evening as well uh, as your copy of they and support independent bookshops while you shop. Um, I'd like to thank our partners at the British Library for hosting this evening and the team at Unique Media for broadcasting this conversation to so many across the world. Thanks too to the teams at Curtis Brown Heritage and Faber for all their work in bringing tonight's discussion together and to the RSL's events manager, Beth Gallimore. You can please join us uh, again next Tuesday in person at the British Library or online for a special event with Gillian Anderson and Andrew O'Hagan discussing what it means to take a text from book to stage and screen. Public tickets are all completely sold out now, um, but you can still attend with a free ticket uh, by becoming an RSL member or digital events pass holder. Uh, our memberships and passes start at £25 a year and anyone can join today. So you can just go to rsliterature.org to buy, buy your membership and get one of the final tickets before they sell out. Uh, I hope I will see as many of you as possible there next week. Uh, but until then, I wanted to say a final huge thanks to all of our speakers for this evening. I'm sure I speak for everybody watching at home when I say a big thank you to you all um, and good night. <laughs>